Good evening and welcome. My name is Simon Forrest. I'm a Yamaji Noongar Wongai man and I'm director of the Centre for Aboriginal Studies here at Curtin University and I'll be your MC for this evening. I welcome you to the 2011 Rob Riley Memorial Lecture. This year's lecture, Breaking Through the Brown Glass Window, will be delivered by Mr Ken White, Federal Member for Hasluck. Before proceedings get underway, a few housekeeping matters. May I ask everyone to check their mobile phones are turned off, and that includes me, or we'll switch to silent. Um, please be aware of the emergency exits, where they're located around the room. Okay. I guess they're through these doors and doors up there. And the toilets and bathrooms are located in the foyer around that side of the um, building. Mr George Wally will deliver this evening's Welcome to Country. Mr Wally is, the, uh, uh, is a community leader in, Ma in Mandra and manager of the Nid Nidjala uh, Wangamaya Health Centre in Mandra. He is a uh, Western Australian music industry uh, award songwriter and musician, an educator of many years, an Aboriginal heritage co consultant and historian. I now invite Mr Wally to welcome you to country. Thank you, Simon. I'm a uh, Binjarab Nyungar man, and um, I'm very uh, thankful and respectful um, to uh, Rob Riley's family. And um, I usually um, read from notes well, not read from notes at different times. It depends where I am and what I need to do. I thought tonight I'd, I'd do a few notes up um, because of the occasion. And in welcoming you to the Rob Riley Memorial Lecture, I would like to express my absolute respect and gratitude that I was asked to do so. In welcoming you here this evening, I would like to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people their family lineage to present and past leaders who shone in the face of adversity and who led with great distinction over many generations before the British invasion here and for generations since. I acknowledge those leaders who gave freely over many years to serve our community and to stand up to the many injustices that confronted our people on a day-to-day -day basis. People like Yelagonga, Mijiguru, Yagan, Monday, to name a few, of those we learn about. And Galyut and Winjan, who also had cultural obligations from the Binjara Buja to the Wajak Buja and our peoples. I would like to acknowledge these amazing Yunga ancestors just as I want to acknowledge the leadership of this generation and for those to follow. In my research and documentation I've seen through public information where generations of oppression have produced many health issues and lack of opportunities today. In researching a person named George Winjan and his life he lived from 1824, it's estimated, to where he died in 1915. And if you think about a person's life over that time of 1824, and then we had the, uh, the change, the great change from being a uh, Nyunga society only to then a British uh, society coming here and a different culture, you can track a person's life you can look at the different policies that were in place. You can look at the society pressures that were upon our people. And we these days are a product of a lot of health issues that come from that. I've lectured on his life and even though it was quite an amazing 
uh, way of putting a person's life up on a screen. It is also a way of looking at the lives of many of our ancestors and the things that we went through. I would hope that Rob would be proud of the efforts to find out and document the life of George Winjan and in doing so to document the past injustices directed towards Noongar people. I want to acknowledge the life of Rob Riley and his dedicated and well documented efforts in fighting for our rights. I knew him as a person who always had a kind word to say and as a person who would encourage people to stand up for our rights and for the rights of our people. He was a good man and his memory will always be associated with our standing efforts to serve his people, just like his ancestors did for our future generations. I look forward to listening to Ken and his lecture and how Rob Rowley brought us all together on this place, like this place tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, and thank you, Mr. Wally, for your welcome to country. I'm delighted to be here today representing the Vice-Chancellor to welcome you to Curtin for the 2011 Rob Riley Memorial Lecture to be presented by Mr. Ken Wyatt. In welcoming you to campus today, I'd like to pay my respects to the Indigenous members of our community by acknowledging the traditional Noongar owners of this land. You are all special guests here today, but in particular, I'd like to welcome the Mayor of South Perth, James Best, who's been a steadfast supporter of Curtin. Welcome, James. The annual Rob Riley Lecture is an important part of our annual calendar of events, and is one of the many ways the university demonstrates its commitment to promoting an understanding of Indigenous culture and history. Curtin University is committed to providing educational opportunities to Indigenous students through both the Centre for Aboriginal Studies and mainstream programs, committed to developing strategies to affect the increased participation of Indigenous students and staff, and continuing our commitment to fostering partners, partnerships in Indigenous research and development. The Centre was established 28 years ago and is recognised as a national leader in its field. It provides students with the skills and abilities they need to work in the community, and it actively promotes a positive sense of Aboriginal identity, culture, and heritage. Its courses cover Indigenous health, community management and development, Indigenous Australian studies, and Indigenous education. And all are designed to provide culturally appropriate education and to create new ways of learning and working in an inclusive Australia. Curtin was the first university in Australia to have a statement of reconciliation and adopt a reconciliation action plan. Last year, Curtin was also the first university to sign the Australian Employment Covenant, <laughs> pledging 30 Indigenous job seekers employment at Curtin over the next three years. Events such as the Rob Riley Memorial Lecture is just one way that Curtin promotes the importance of recognising Indigenous culture and its importance to our community. Thank you all for attending this evening and I'm sure you'll greatly enjoy this year's Memorial Lecture by Ken Wyatt. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Quinn. So as we know, this lecture tonight is in honour of Rob Riley. He was an Indigenous statesman and leader of his people whose untimely death was mourned throughout Australia. Inspired by his conviction that Australia had to confront its history of dispossession of Aboriginal people from their lands and all that has flowed from it, he worked tirelessly to advance social justice and reconciliation with non-Indigenous Australians. 
Rob was chairperson of the National Aboriginal Conference, chief executive officer of the Aboriginal Legal Service, and was awarded the Human Rights Commission's uh, Human Rights Medal posthumously in 1996. The inaugural Rob Riley Memorial Lecture was held in 2004 and included, and included the unveiling of a portrait of Rob painted by Indigenous artist Julie Dowling. Lectures have been held each year since 2004 featuring uh, prominent Indigenous speakers. As we said, tonight's presenter of the Rob Riley Memorial Lecture is Mr Ken Wyatt. Mr Wyatt is the federal member for Hasluck and the first Indigenous Australian to be elected to the House of Representatives. He is the eldest child of Don and Mona Wyatt who raised 10 children. He grew up in Corrigan before moving to Perth to study and work. Mr Wyatt graduated from Mount Morley Teachers College and then worked as a primary school teacher before moving into leadership roles in education. In 1996, he was made member of the Order of Australia for Services to Aboriginal Health and he also received the Centenary Medal in 2001. Achieving, achieving a um, House of Representatives seat was an achievement out of reach for many Indigenous Australians. And for Mr Wyatt, it is a chance to help shift the sands of time and open up new opportunities for Indigenous Australians. Mr Wyatt is also related to Ben Wyatt, MLA, Member for Victoria Park and the State Shadow Minister for Education. Uh, ben Wyatt is a long time friend of Curtin, but unfortunately is not able to be with us here today and sends his apologies. I now invite Ken Wyatt to deliver the 2011 Rob Riley Memorial Lecture, Breaking Through the Brown Glass Ceiling. Can I commence by acknowledging Jenny and Rob's family? Rob Riley was an inspiration to many of us, and in particular, I enjoyed the fellowship that I had with him in some of the debates that we had on a range of issues, but particularly education. I also want to commence by acknowledging the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation on whose land we meet. I acknowledge our elders, who in the past were the keepers of the Durbal Yerrigan and the lands around it, and our elders present tonight whose wisdom and guidance keeps us alive in our culture and keeps it vibrant. It is indeed a tremendous privilege to present the 2011 annual Rob Riley Memorial Lecture tonight. Rob Riley epitomises to me someone who broke through many of the layers of the brown glass ceiling by both his doggedness and his determination to achieve outcomes beyond that that we often accepted. I believe that when Rob couched these words, you can't be wrong if you fight and if you don't stop fighting for justice simply because those around you don't like it. He was expressing the critical aspect of thought that I want to share with you tonight. I am a Noongar with Yamaji and Wongai heritage and I was born in Bunbury, Western Australia where my mother was in Roland's mission. And as a young boy, I spent time in Nanain Mika Thara, and from 1959, Corrigan in a rural community in Western Australia. I have a strong passion for what I do and a strong commitment to walking and working with others to achieve better outcomes and opportunities for Indigenous Australians. In fact, for all Australians in Australian society. As a teenager, I loved the following song lyrics from the song Because I Love You by the Master's Apprentices. The song was released in 1970. In a sense, it became a personal anthem and a driver for my approach in the journey to being elected as the member for at the House of Representatives, representing the seat of Hasluck. And the words that always played in my mind and still does when I hear the song is, do what you want to do, be what you want to be. Because I think, in a sense, that encapsulates, for me, the potential and the possibility to do things that you dream of and that you aspire to. Our destiny is shaped by the choices we make and the decisions that each of us enact in our career and social pathways. 
What is critical to bringing about success is our individual preparedness to challenge and overcome barriers and to deal with the setbacks to our dreams and aspirations. Importantly, the development of an ethos of working hard, commitment to your goals, persistency and following through brings success. I developed a strong belief in myself, my abilities and my capacity to work towards my personal goals whilst being inclusive of others. It doesn't matter if the interactions are positive or negative. They serve as a point of learning. Every interaction with another individual provides an avenue to acquire knowledge, information and experiences that enhance my repertoire of skills. These skills enable me to rise to the positions, influence and demonstrate capabilities for the roles I have gained. I believe that all Australians need to be proud of their cultural heritage because our culture is not a barrier to our destiny. Instead, the barrier is the toolkit of life that we have at our disposal to achieve our aspirations and overcome barriers. Three significant barriers that any individual has to contend with include the mindset, attitudes and prejudices of others who can determine whether or not we succeed and whether the pathway that we choose will be either impeded. But I also believe that given the right help to achieve our personal and professional aspirations is also equally important. Imagine two individuals who are mechanics in their own right, who find out that they have a problem with their current model car or yours, given that you've taken it to their garage. One has a 500-piece toolkit that has every item and computer technology to analyse and problem-solve, and thereby enabling them to identify the solution in repairing the vehicle. They're dressed in a uniform. They look appealing. Compare this to another mechanic who has a toolkit of 50 pieces, which limits their capacity to fully analyse the problem. But they have, because of their commensurate skills, have the sense of the problem. They know a possible solution, but don't have the right range of tools and equipment to repair the vehicle. They're wearing old blue overalls covered with oil stains. You observe the toolkits that both have, and based on what is seen on the surface, which is often the influencing factor that we use to form our judgments and assumptions. And we base it on what we observe. We make a choice which is based on the observation. And our perception frames the way that we consider both mechanics. And I believe that to be true of any individual that we interview or we come in contact with, in the course of their aspirations, we make judgments. Yet both mechanics completed their apprenticeships with distinction. They have the same knowledge, skills and competencies, and yet without giving full consideration to their individual capability, we make a personal judgment. Equally, within the workplace, we give advantage to individuals based on personal mindsets, our disposition, and we champion their growth and progression. The mechanic who we form a negative view about, based on observation and assumption, is left at the level of employment and their progression within the company is slowed. We do not champion their professional growth because we have formed a negative mindset about them. A simplistic analogy, but one that is often played out when we make assumptions about individuals based on gender, culture, and academic achievement. Our mindset, assumptions and prejudices is the most contributing factors to the concept of the glass ceiling syndrome. The phrase glass ceiling refers to an invisible barrier that prevents someone from achieving further success. It is most often heard in the context of women who cannot advance to the highest levels of power in the workplace. 
The glass ceiling is a way of describing whatever keeps women from achieving power and success equal to that of men. Equally, it is a glass ceiling which prevents culturally and linguistically diverse persons and minority groups from advancing to leadership positions due to attitudinal or organisational bias within the workforce. It is an invisible but real barrier through which the next stage or level of development can be seen but cannot be reached by a section of qualified, capable and deserving employees. Such barriers exist due to implicit prejudices on the basis of age, ethnicity, political or religious affiliation and or gender. And let me say that in recent times, our impressions of our ageing population has created a concept of ageism, whereby we think that an individual who is 50, 55 plus has reached the end of their effective working life, and yet we are prepared to cast aside incredible corporate knowledge, a lifetime of experiences and skills, because we have a perception to do with age. Whilst, it is, whilst the expression was developed to apply to the workplace in respect to gender, I would suggest that the glass ceiling is not confined to the workplace, but equally applied in many other circumstances and lo locations where individuals hit invisible barriers that impede their progress. It dents their aspirational goals, but they persist. So where did the term glass ceiling come from? And I think it's important just to go back in the history of the glass ceiling because it has become a paradigm for which we often address issues of barriers but sometimes don't find the solutions. The term glass ceiling was used by two women at Hewlett Packard in 1979, Catherine Lawrence and Marianne Schreiber, to describe how while on the surface there seemed to be a clear path to promotion, in actuality, women seemed to hit a point where they seemed to be unable to progress beyond the point at which they reach. In 1984, the glass ceiling was used by Gay Bryant in her book, The Working Woman Report, in which Bryant examined the status of women in the workplace. Further, it was also used by Carol Heimowitz and Timothy Shelbert in an article on the 24th of March, 1986 edition of the Wall Street Journal to refer to invisible barriers that impeded the career advancement of women. The phrase was popularised by the media in the 80s and in recent times was used by Senator Hillary Clinton in her concession speech when she withdrew from the 20, 2008 Democratic primaries, and I quote, and although we weren't able to shatter the hardest and highest glass ceiling this time, thanks to you, it got about 18 million cracks. The term glass ceiling was endorsed and used by the US Department of Labor in 1991 in response to a study of nine Fortune 500 companies. The Federal Glass Ceiling Commission study confirmed that women and minorities encountered considerable glass ceiling barriers in their careers. These barriers were experienced earlier in their professions than previously thought. I like the expression, a ceiling made of glass would be see-through. A woman can see, clearly see those above her who are more powerful. Instead of being able to achieve the same success, she is stopped by invisible forces that prevent her from rising further. Why? Because it conveys the notion of seeing what is. But you cannot be get, go beyond to attain the higher levels available to the selected. The stop, do not enter message is clear and unambiguous. You have reached your level within the organisation and you are not going beyond. Change is slowly evolving in Australia, although within the gender equalisation equation, I do not see as a professional nor is a young man the representation of gender equity equally for all women. Within senior management structures of government agencies, statutory bodies and in the private sector, 
there is a noticeable lack of culturally and linguistically diverse groups represented. This would be true of government corporate boards and government committees. They do not reflect the broader community demographic. This brings me to the concept of the brown glass ceiling, which I believe to be the layer that sits underneath the glass ceiling that white Anglo-Saxon women experience. The brown glass ceiling is like a two-way mirror whereby you can see what is possible to achieve. And if we were equal and had similar opportunities to those above it, on the other side of the glass are the supervisors and managers who have a mindset and expectation that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people operate at less than the optimum level in comparison to non-Indigenous peers. This is particularly noticeable where Indigenous Australians work in equivalent positions in an organisation. There is sometimes a notion of black skills that are not transferable to an equivalent position and like the mechanic, they are rarely given the opportunity to act at an equivalent organisational role or act in a supervisory position above theirs. They are often overlooked. They are perceived to be highly capable of dealing with Aboriginal issues, but not with organisations' actual business. I know of managers in government agencies that are sent out in the field to deal with Aboriginal communities and local issues when their counterparts in the organisation never do this but rely on staff in the field to resolve the issues. It's unique, but it's not uncommon. I believe the concept of a brown glass ceiling is not only confined to employment and economic fields where outcomes are poor, but equally to other key areas which have been included in the National Indigenous Reform Agreement, which forms the basis for a way in which Australia will deal with the levels of disadvantage and disparity within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. The agreement clearly identifies the existence of a multi-layered set of brown glass ceilings which Aboriginal children, adolescents and adults have to break through in order to achieve gains. Why do I believe this? And from the purest position, seem to be stretching the boundaries of the concept and the intent of the glass ceiling? It is because the levels of challenge are immense and very few make it to the glass ceiling, particularly our women. Men seem to be more likely to make it to leadership positions and if we reflect on the number of men who hold leadership positions across government in key organisation, it far outweighs the number of women. Perhaps the term concrete ceiling is more apt description in that it describes the type of barrier minority women encounter. Caucasian women may face the glass ceiling in the workforce but are able to break through it from time to time. However, Minority women's glass ceilings tend to be more solid and unyielding. This concrete ceiling is due to minority women facing both the issues of sexism and racism, which intensifies their obstruction in advancing within the labour market. The National Indigenous Reform Agreement articulates the challenge for all Australian governments. Now, I want to look at the ceiling that is most critical in the pathway and journeys that have to be taken. Despite the concerted efforts of successive Commonwealth, state and territory governments to address Indigenous disadvantage, there have been difficulties and only modest improvements in outcomes in some areas such as education and health, with other areas either remaining static or worsening. Even in those areas where there have been improvements, the outcomes for Indigenous Australians remain far short of the outcomes for non-Indigenous Australians. In December 2007, the Council of Australian Governments agreed to the National Indigenous Reform Agreement partnership between all levels of government. It also provided links to those national agreements and national partnership across, agreements across COAG which includes elements that aimed at closing the gap in Indigenous disadvantage. The National Indigenous Reform Agreement is the basis 
of the COAG reform agenda. What I find interesting is that COAG recognises that individuals and communities should have the opportunity to benefit from the mainstream economy, real jobs, business opportunities, economic dependence and wealth creation. Ultimately, Indigenous economic development is about providing Indigenous people with the same opportunities as non-Indigenous Australians. The economic group that creates, the, sorry, the economic growth that creates well-being for the non-Indigenous population is primarily achieved through the activities of the private sector. This will not achieve this universally because education is the cornerstone for change and is a prerequisite for employment within our contemporary society and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people Education is a brown glass ceiling. I was invited to write the foreword to the West Australian Aboriginal Child Health Survey, Volume 3, The Educational Experiences of Aboriginal Children and Young People, which was officially launched on the 24th of March, 2008. And I will quote directly from that foreword. Education is the great engine of personal development it is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, that the son of a mine worker can become the head of a mine, that the child of a farm worker can become the president of a great nation. These were the words uttered by Nelson Mandela at an important occasion. Of the numerous research reports into Aboriginal education, there is none so profound as the West Australian Aboriginal Child Health Survey improving the educational experiences of Aboriginal children and young people. It provided confronting evidence that the benefits of education remain poorly realised by the vast majority of West Australian Aboriginal children. And I doubt that this would be dissimilar in other jurisdictions. The more fundamental issue is the failure over the past 35 years by education providers to improve educational outcomes of the vast majority of Aboriginal children. It is important to accept the reality that failure over the past 30 years to improve educational outcomes for the vast majority of Aboriginal school children has affected three generations of Aboriginal children and young people who are highly likely to have limited access to lifelong learning, employment and economic opportunities. There has also been tacit acceptance of the non-achievement of educational by Aboriginal children and young people. The resultant acceptance of this lack of educational success has a cumulative effect. It is based on the belief that Aboriginal children and young people will never reach their full potential. And if they fall behind society, in society, then welfare will protect them. Their low level of educational success is accepted as a normative expectation not a great deal has changed. It has become acceptable for Aboriginal children and young people to work at level unless it becomes problematic or the socio-political structures are pressured to bring about change. There is a moral obligation to redress the needs of Aboriginal children and young people to be successful and achieve the level of education attainment that builds social and human capital and to be achievers in the Australian and global community. Education is recognised by OECD member states as a fundamental key to wealth creation and competitiveness in a global information economy. Those societies which continue to invest in education, training and employment of their people have prospered and enjoy a high standard of living and access to resources, health, human and social capital which builds upon individual and societal success. All Australian governments acknowledge that investing in education and training is essential to Australia's economic and social prosperity. It is about positioning our country to meet the new challenges and opportunities in international markets. In a world without economic borders, the emerging new knowledge-based society, the pressures for change, global and international competitiveness, access to information and technology and new emerging clients. Just think of where Aboriginal children who are not exiting the schooling system sit 
in the construct of a brown glass ceiling in education. Australia will require a flexible, well-educated, well-trained, high-performing workforce to achieve and sustain these reforms. This will pose problems for the majority of Aboriginal children and young people who continue to perform poorly with their education because they will not access the opportunities which will flow from well educated which will flow for well educated Australians. There is a growing demand for an educated, more highly trained and more technically skilled workforce. However, when I look at organisations, most Aboriginal workers are at the lower and shrinking end of the employment market and are becoming part of a growing underclass. The question that arises for Aboriginal children and young people is why are they excluded from the advantages of being an integral part of a vision in which Australia's global competitiveness and future depends on all Australians having the necessary education, training and learning ability and is dependent upon the application of knowledge to support innovation, stimulate business development and improve workforce productivity to live productive and fulfilling lives. It is important for Aboriginal children and young people to acquire and become proficient in standard Australian English, as well as to be taught to recognise the way in which language is used, contextualised and understood and applied within a global and knowledge-based society in order to participate in Australia's economy. The task of developing appropriate resources and teaching Aboriginal students to become more proficient in standard Australian English should be achievable. Over a period of uh, 12 years, a student should be able to learn English when it is considered in this context. And I want you to think about this. English has 26 letters and only 44 sounds. It has an approximate total of 550,000 words. 2,000 words make up 90% of most speech. 400 words make up 65% of most writing and there are only 70 main spelling combinations. Why then is it that at the end of 12 years of schooling, our children have not broken through the education brown glass ceiling. Graduation from the final year of secondary schooling provides measures of success, including completion of school, entry to university and higher education, access to TAFE, apprenticeships, traineeships and employment, and an income. Aboriginal young people who do not achieve secondary education and who do not acquire the basic skills of literacy and numeracy are unlikely to be competitive in the labour market. They will subsequently remain vulnerable to structural change within the labour market, government reform, and therefore will be reliant on government income support. They will experience the brown glass ceiling throughout their life unless they return to second chance education, or more, more correctly, further their educational pathways. Paula Groot and Sylvia Sonderberger make the point that the glass ceiling is one of the most controversial and emotive aspects of employment in organisations, exhibiting the following features that are frequently thought to characterise the problem. Firstly, there is a lower number of female employees in higher positions. Secondly, women have to work harder than men to obtain equivalent jobs. Thirdly, women are paid less than men when promoted and some organisations are more female friendly than others. I would contend that indigeneity is an additional characteristic which adds the brown to the colour of the glass for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It is the key ingredient of the brown glass ceiling. Whilst many will deny this is a factor, it is our reality for Aboriginal women because in two areas that I've worked, education and health, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women tend to be in significant numbers either as Aboriginal health workers or Aboriginal and Islander education officers and are sparse at the upper levels of the organisation. As human beings, we are ingenious in the way that we develop definitions for circumstances. In this instance, AIEOs and AHWs 
experienced the variation to the glass ceiling, which is the sticky floor. The sticky floor refers to women who are trapped in low-wage, low-mobility jobs in state and local government. I want to turn back to the United States of America's Glass Ceiling Commission to further my point for the impact of the glass ceiling. The United States of America's Glass Ceiling Commission was established in 1991 to study the barriers and issues and make recommendations to eliminate the hindrances to the advancement of women and minorities to management and decision-making positions. It is the unseen yet unbreachable barrier that keeps minorities and women from rising to the upper rungs of the corporate ladder, regardless of their qualifications and achievements. Breaking glass ceiling barriers in corporate America will not result from any single act or event Rather, it'll be the culmination of a process involving people and organisations from all segments of our society. The Commission went on to say that they found minorities and women are still constantly underrepresented and underutilised at the highest levels of corporate America. For example, 97% of senior managements of the Fortune 1000 industrial uh, Fortune 500 companies are white and 95 to 97% are male. In the Fortune 2000 Industrial and Services Company, only 5% of senior managers are women, and almost all of them are white. African-American men with professional degrees earn 20% less than their non-Afro-American counterparts, holding the same degrees in the same job categories. But women and Afro-Americans are not the only one kept down by the glass ceiling. Only 0.4% of managers are Hispanic, although Hispanics make up 8% of America's workforce. Asian and Pacific Islander Americans earn less than whites in comparable positions and receive fewer promotions, despite having more formal education than any other group. Generally, the lack of educational opportunity drastically reduces the available pool of American Indian candidates, and chief executive officers rarely consider them for management jobs. Would we mirror the same results in the workplace in Australia if such a study was to be undertaken? I suspect that there would be a strong correlations with the finding of the American Commission. The advent of reconciliation and the adoption of the reconciliation action plans have had an impact on the increase in the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people employed within government, business and the private sector. One of the major challenges that remain to be addressed is not only the number of staff employed, but the number at all levels of the organisation, including the senior executive and management levels. Certainly when I reflect back on health and the health department, the majority of the 280 odd staff that we had at that time were Aboriginal health workers. There were three people in management positions, there were four in central office and a director's position that was identified. That was the extent across the level of the tiers of the health department of Western Australia. If we were serious, in breaking the brown glass ceiling, then those numbers would have been commensurately higher and not in identified positions, nor in Aboriginal health, but across the continuum of all positions that are reflected in the makeup of a health department. In examining organisations, it would be interesting to identify the number of staff employed in respect to the gender mix. How many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and men are in identified positions that is, Aboriginality is a requirement versus the number in organisational positions. The number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and men in the same position and level that they commenced employment at. The number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and men in supervisory and management roles. And the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women within the senior executive service positions, including board membership. I think that we would see the pyramid 
of large numbers at the base but very few at the top. The United States of America's Glass Ceiling Commission also stated the following, and I quote, discrimination, the glass ceiling in particular, remains another deep line of demarcation between those who prosper and those who are left behind. Affirmative action properly, impl properly implemented does not Im mean imposing quotas, allowing preferential treatment or employing or promoting unqualified people. It means opening the system and casting a net wide to recruit, train and promote opportunities for advancement for people who can contribute effectively to a corporation and consequently the nation's economy. The definition of affirmative action embodies efforts to increase the supply of qualified individuals of all ethnic groups and both genders, having access to widely different ethnic, racial and social backgrounds, accelerates the quest for corporate excellence. One of our nation's greatest assets is our diversity. It is our strength. It is also Australia's strength. But we also have to take the step in removing the glass ceiling, and in particular the brown glass ceiling. As commerce becomes more global and competitive, it is, in, it is imperative that businesses engage the full potential of our labour force, which is increasingly composed of women and minorities from diverse backgrounds and cultures. I do not advocate the lowering of the bar for any field or work or endeavour but suggest there are alternative methods to addressing the brown glass ceiling and certainly to developing human capacity. Every individual that we ever come in contact with or interact with has their own unique qualities, competencies and skills. We need to expose Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff to opportunities that include acting in non-identified positions, appointed into acting positions at a higher level than theirs and engage them in the process of the organisation's strategic business decisions. We did that during the shift to addressing the equalisation of gender balance within the workforce. What I find interesting in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs is if we do that, the first question that you get asked is, how many traineeship positions will you give me to train Aboriginal staff? And yet when we did the gender equalisation, that was never the question that was asked. The strategy were the ones that I outlined. They were inclusive and they incorporated the organisations committing positions that existed, jobs that were real, into that equation. The support and driver for a new approach must be championed by the organisation's chief executive officer. All line managers must be held to account in growing the capability and capacity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff and acknowledge for each successful employee who they engage in progression within the organisation. The brown glass ceiling can be chipped away progressively through this approach, as well as providing supported programs such as headhunting individuals mentoring, providing workplace experiences and giving the appropriate guidance. It's interesting that in the past, the common practice to take on new employees who commenced their career on the shop floor was common. Training and mentoring was provided to develop them, shape them into the organisation's workforce, expose them to a range of experiences that build on existing competencies and skills, and ultimately they progress from the factory floor into supervisory and management roles, and in some cases, they became the owner of the company. They were encouraged and provided with career advice within the company. In this environment, supervisors and management identified and over time encouraged employees into leadership and supervisory roles, fostering and building the skills needed. The United States of America's Glass Ceiling Commission identified characteristics of successful programs that if offered to Indigenous Australians could result in many of them breaking through the brown glass ceiling. And I want to share with you their suggestions. They suggested rotational and non-traditional job assignments that broaden the base of a candidate's experience and visibility. One of the key things that they said about visibility is if you put people 
into lower level jobs where they are out of the sight and out of line of sight of management, then their progression rates are highly diminished and significantly diminished. Whereas if they are in sight, they get the opportunity to develop specific career path programs that identify objective performance, skill and knowledge criteria for advancement. Part of that has to be the recognition of cultural skills that we bring. Employee sponsored networks and affinity groups, access to specialised training, seminars and workshops to enhance skills, formal succession planning, taking an individual from level to a path that will lead to promotion and progression. Formal mentoring programs that provide guidance to future executives within the corporate structure and then building expertise and empowering people lacking role models and, and advisors throughout the community by making senior executive available to young adults who will be future business leaders within their company or society. I want to conclude by sharing aspects of my experience of breaking through the brown glass ceiling. And I want those of us who are over 50, and there are a few of us in this room, particularly Indigenous or Aboriginal people in here. The prior to 1972, we were covered by the Native Welfare Act. That act determined what we were able to do, the approval to travel, the approval to marry, and we developed a mindset of having to seek permission to do many of the things that were part of our daily life. But we also lived in a period when we were deemed to need special circumstances different, and that included the Aboriginal bar at hotels, in hospitals, the Aboriginal wing of a hospital, and there wasn't a mixing. If you went to the cinema, the front row was for Aboriginal people. It was a period in which we had our early years of schooling, but I think that we also had the opportunity, and I hungered to acquire knowledge and information. I utilised opportunities for leadership and worked to improve on what I had achieved. I developed an ethic to achieve even though there were barriers including overt racism. I learned from my failures, appreciated success but I have retained the essence of who I am and I don't intend ever changing that. When I was approached to nominate for the seat of Hasluck in 2003, I declined the offer because I had made a commitment to take up the offer of a position as the Director of Aboriginal Health in New South Wales Health. I needed a new challenge outside of my own community to enhance my existing life and work experiences and to accept the daunting task of stepping outside of my level of comfort. At the time, I thought I'd thrown away any chance I ever had of standing for a seat in the Australian Parliament. I moved to New South Wales and worked there for approximately four and a half years before returning home to Perth. I must admit that the journey was tremendous because I learned to be re I relearned to be humble and to work with people, and to take away the notion that I had been a big fish in a small pond and had learned to become the small fish in a big pond. And that experience gives you insights and understandings of challenges that you had forgotten as a leader. At the launch of a mental health initiative in Fremantle, I was asked to nominate for the Cedar Hasluck, which I initially declined. But when my colleagues returned with two, when my colleague returned with two other members of the party, 15 minutes later and cornered me, I indicated that I would give some sort, some thought to nominating. It seemed daunting, but I commenced the process of seeking information, meeting with people within the hierarchy of the party to sound them out, and ascertained what I needed to do in order to win pre-selection. I sought the counsel of trusted friends and made my decision to nominate. I was made aware that there was a favoured son who was a strong contender and that there were a total of five nominations, including mine. I had to work diligently to gain political support prior to pre-selection. 
and then plan my approach to convincing 45 delegates that I was the right candidate to represent the Liberal Party in the election for the seat of Hasluck. If ever you've gone for an interview and you've had a panel of three or four people for a job, it is daunting. When you stand before 45 people that you don't know and you have to present your credentials in 12 minutes and answer a series of questions off the floor, it is more daunting. And you have to have the confidence to sell yourself. Because let me say, as Aboriginal people, we always say we. When we talk about ourselves, we never say I. We say we. Because we have grown up in a community where it is us as a community. It is we as a people or we as a family. And I had to change my thinking in the way that I sold myself. And I sat in the same room as the candidates and we met each other and got to know each other. And each time I answered questions that they were asking in the conversations, I deliberately made sure that I said I in order to prepare myself. I stated from the outset that I was of Aboriginal descent so that they understood very clearly that I was proud of who I was, but I also wanted them to know that I was an Aboriginal person. And then I put my case as to why I should be pre-selected. I won support and following State Council's endorsement, I <coughs> commenced campaigning. I established a campaign team and establishing that team is absolutely paramount. I looked at what I had to do to fundraise. People have this misconception that we are given money for a campaign, we're not. We have to raise every cent. And let me say that my campaign was in excess of 300,000 that I had to raise. And I had to raise and campaign within an 18 week period. So it was hard work. Establishing a campaign team was paramount. Fundraising and developing campaign strategies, analysing and planning became critical. Long days and hard work became the daily pattern. Rising at 4.30 and often getting to bed at about 11. The most daunting task I had was knocking on the first 10 doors. It's nerve wracking, but you rapidly gain confidence and learn to sell who you are to people, accept polite rejections, develop ways to communicate with people who tell you what they think of you, your party and the Australian political system. But you grow from that and you don't allow that to become a barrier. As an Indigenous Australians, as Indigenous Australians, we are always part of our community. So we always work together. And I found that as I knocked on each door, I grew in confidence and started to strongly believe that I had the opportunity as a Nyunga person to become a member of the House of Representatives. At no stage did I doubt my capability to fight an election, to campaign and win, because I called upon my experiences, my belief in myself and the trust I had in the members of Team Hasluck. To me, no brown glass ceiling was going to prevent me from rising above my aspiration. My education, work experience and knowledge served me well. And whilst there were days when I doubted our headway over the 18 weeks of campaigning, I had no sense of ever giving up. The words of Dan Deardorff sum up how I took on this challenge. You go for it, all the stops are out. Caution to the wind and you are battling with everything you have. That's the real fun of the game. Winning the seat of Hasluck, no matter how small the margin, and the margin is only 948 votes, it is one street, one long street in my electorate. The win was sweet because I'd held my own as an equal against a formidable opponent who was the incumbent member with an impressive record. When I stood in the chamber as the 1,093rd member of the House of Representatives, 
and delivered my first speech as an equal, I felt an incredible sense of having broken through the brown glass ceiling. I felt a great sense of personal pride, but equally a stronger pride that I was a Nyunga from Western Australia standing in that chamber and wearing the booker given to me by elders on my shoulder that day was equally more rewarding in that when I look back on it now, it clearly shows that our cultural identity is not a barrier and that we do and can transcend brown glass ceilings. I knew at that point that we can achieve our aspirations and dreams and that our culture is not a barrier, but something that we should be proud of. We are the descendants of the Nyungar people who are a living culture that has continu continuously prevailed in Western Australia for over 40,000 years. And in the role that I have, I want to make a difference for others as the member of Hasluck. Many of us have transcended the brown glass ceiling and many more will follow. I want us to always remember, and I will always remember, do what you want to do and be who you want to be. Because if you have that as a simple anthem, it gives you the capacity to rise to challenges, to believe that there is no barrier, that the bollards of life can be gone around, and that they will never prevent you from aspiring to the things that you wish to achieve. Setbacks will be there. But let me tell you that the journey that I took through those front doors down to my seat, and then sitting each day in that parliament, reminds me that I hope to see in the future other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples sitting in that house in their own right as equals and I suppose, in closing, the challenge for me now is to marry the expectations of our <coughs> nations of people, my constituents and party obligations. And let me tell you, the expectations of our own people is extremely strong. The calls that both Ben and I have on us nationally and at the state and local level is always significant. My staff balance the demands on my time. But let me say that I also want to remind people that the brown glass ceiling is there, but we have to collectively as a society break down those ceilings and barriers that prevent people taking the pathways into the next two decades into the future and into our global economy. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Just before we take a couple of questions, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. One, Ken mentioned di diversity in uh, Australia as um, the world's second most culturally diverse nation. We have a, a very significant role to play, I think, in terms of how we deal uh, and work with other peoples. Um, if Hillary Clinton can't smash through a glass window within a glass, glass ceiling, I don't know who can then. Um, but I started to think about if we're below the glass window, I mean, it's very hard to try and smash it. You know, we've got to smash it. And um, when you're below it, it's very hard. If it's for those above, I think it's relatively easy. So those above have got a responsibility. But I think those above, for the last 20 years, and unless um, some uh, moves are afoot, this, they're dropping pebbles, not making much of an effort to break that uh, glass ceiling. Um, so we've got some time uh, to take some questions. There'll be a couple of people, as it's being recorded, your questions will need to be uh, addressed into a microphone and there's going to be a couple of people walking around with mics. So if you raise your hand if you've got a question and I'll direct the microphone to that person and you can ask Ken a question. My name is uh, Richard Titilius and I was, um, uh, Ken, very impressed with what you were saying uh, earlier about you don't want to, when it comes to education, you don't want to leave um, certain people out and that everyone, all uh, um, Aboriginal people especially, should have that opportunity uh, to participate in the workforce and participation and so on. And um, 
1999, I met um, a Noongar woman and she became an Aboriginal trainee at the um, place where I work, the Perth Magistrates Courts, and um, she encountered a lot of opposition there and if it wasn't for some of her elders, she would not have finished that one year. She was under a lot of pressure to, to um, give up. And in meeting uh, her and her family, I have also seen that in the Belmont, Rivervale, Redcliffe, Coondoola, Hamilton Hill, there are those Aboriginal uh, families that they have very poor households and the children will be lucky to get to school and when they get home they often don't have places to do homework and um, parents that are on drugs or in prison and things like that and they've also come from families that have often been a part of the stolen generations and so forth so here in 2011 there's still some work uh, left to do. How do you think that you can include these people so that they get anywhere near the brown glass ceiling? Thank you. One of the challenges that all leaders have is to play the role of advocacy, to identify where the challenges still are. The, the, the thing that staggers me is that the data that is available through every single collection point in government agencies and that form part of the Council of Australian Government's national reporting clearly shows that there are considerable gaps still. One of the challenges that we have is to work as a community in addressing this. It is also about the leadership being cohesive in a vision that encompasses every family. At the moment, the closing the gap strategy does not encompass every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander family. They're regionally located. They have particular specificity around them. And on that alone, then we will not reach those families. Part of a strategy that I want to lead with in my electorate is to work with Aboriginal elders and leaders to target and identify. Because I suspect that if we look at a typical uh, bell curve across the 800,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, one quartile will not need that level of intervention because they will be employed and in roles such as Simon and I, but there will also be the second quartile who are propelling upwards and who are becoming successful in generating a wealth base. It is the bottom two quartiles that we should focus on. Realistically, we should be able to case manage every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander family in that bottom quartile and in the, second, in the third quartile. So I think we have to think about how we do that. The other point I wanted to make earlier is that we need to empower people to be equals in the solutions that are developed because too often what happens is the solutions are imposed by well-meaning people within government agencies. And certainly the person you're referring to that you work with has seen me on a couple of occasions and I've certainly used my position as a leader prior to entering parliament to also help in circumstances. So each of us that hold senior positions have to chip away at the brown glass ceiling at the top to reach those that are under it. Ken, uh, Danny Ford. Um, quick, uh, just one of your comments. Well, firstly, I just want to say, uh, as you know, we're very, very proud of you and what you've achieved. And uh, um, I know that when you got in there, say, oh, I know that bloke. So that was good. <laughs> Um, my, my query is my, it's more of a comment from yourself. We've had like assimilation, integration, self-determination, self-management, all these kinds of phases of you know, policy uh, direction. Uh, for me, I personally, I'm kind of a bit confused about where we are now. We have you know, we've had a reconciliation process, we've had uh, the intervention, uh, the apology, closing the gap initiatives. So this is really a weird twilight zone for me around what kind of phase we're in right now. Do you have any comments about that? Look, I'd prefer that we throw away the tags, that we look at what the opportunities are that we create. Because if we take the driving of this and we stop being passive recipients of policies and programs, but become reactive in shaping them and determining how they should be delivered, then that is the way to go. Each of those ism tags, I think we've just got to jettison and become much more proactive in saying, 
there are services that governments offer. We shouldn't talk about mainstream services because they're not mainstream, they are government services offered to all of its citizenry. What we have to do is optimise our opportunities with them. When we do that, we will make a difference. Ken, Clem Rodney. <clears throat> we, you talk about the glass ceiling, but I, it's something that I think that the glass ceiling is clouded by the middle rung of Caucasian males that are in the public sector and places of middle management. How do you think, how do you think that we can break through that? Because that, I think, is where the main stumbling block for both men, of for women, but also for Aboriginal people for getting through to that glass ceiling. I like what women did. Women kept the conscious voice bubbling away, making inroads, and when they made the inroads, they celebrated. We don't do that. And to take away the cloudiness of the glass, we have to have a clear vision of what we want to achieve and then help those to achieve it. That's why I've always liked what the Inuits have done, where they determined within their community the skill mix that they needed. So they needed lawyers, teachers, etc. The National Aboriginal Education Committee in the late 1980s decided they needed 2,000 teachers by, uh, sorry, 2,000 teachers by 1990. We got that. We exceeded that. We got 2,700. So we built the capacity of individuals to either go into teaching or many became public servants and started to influence the reform agenda. The trouble is we have, <coughs> excuse me, we haven't pushed it far enough. And I think in that sense, that mandating an approach will not work. It has to be by people movements and people movements are much more powerful because they hold others up to scrutiny. They also challenge collectively. And in one sense, um, what is sad is we haven't done that. And yet we've had some great leaders over the years, I think of Charlie Perkins, who I learned a lot from. Uh, others like John Moriarty. Uh, there are others, Clem, that you'd be aware of who've influenced um, some of your thinking. They have, but we've never done it collectively. And at some point, and I certainly intend within the sphere of the work I do within the parliament to continually raise this as an issue. Uh, Alan Carter, just a quick question, Ken, about the new First People's Congress, which is coming up, start beginning fairly shortly. How do you see yourself in the context of that new organisation? Actually, my role is fundamentally that of a member of the House of Representatives and representing an electorate. But my interface with them will depend on issues as they arise, because I am attending their first dinner. Uh, both myself and Linda Burney have been invited to address the Congress as well. And in my discussions with Sam Jeffries, Tom Kalmar, uh, and others, the discussions have been around how do we relate? Are you prepared to look at some of the issues we have so that you can advocate them within the party processes? And equally, Warren Mundine within the Labor Party movement is doing the same. So by being, and I made a comment many years ago that if you want change and you want sustainable change, you've got to be on the inside to influence those who control. And if you're on the inside, then you have some hope of changing things. When you're outside, and I, I, look, let me say I'm glad I'm out of the bureaucracy because I'm not constrained by the line management process and I'm not constrained by the fact I'm limited in what I can say. I now have the opportunity to be uh, much more proactive and much more challenging. And that's the freedom that I'm enjoying. But certainly I'm enjoying the freedom of our democracy by being in the house that makes many of the decisions that impact on our lives daily. My name is Charles Missy, um, Mr. Wyatt. I'm, I am from the Torres Strait. I'm a student with the Centre for Aboriginal Studies. And uh, my concern is uh, it's about the uh, intervention in the Northern Territory for a start. You see, we have uh, the Howard government denigrating the um, Northern Territory Land Rights Act. Now, 
as an Aboriginal person, you understand the value of the land and the culture. And yet, we find that the Gillard government has also taken that stand regarding um, doing away with the land rights. Maybe not now, but it seems in, in the long term. And it seems to be that uh, as a similar situation is, uh, will take place in the Torres Straits because only two weeks ago, one of uh, our representative of Leichhardt, Mr. Warren Inch, did make a statement regarding um, the sale of uh, turtle and uh, dugong meat. He, he, he alleged that uh, someone from the Torres Strait and from Papua New Guinea, they were selling the flesh on the uh, mainland for $50 a kilo. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I don't think so because um, one, of our, one of my friends did make a, did challenge Mr. Mr. Inch and saying, look, if you make a statement like that, please back it up and uh, name the persons. But he also said that uh, it seems that he doesn't understand the culture of the people when he said that, you know, you make these statements but, uh, and you threaten to bring the Sea Shepherd and the Greenpeace movement into the Torres Strait to do away with our cultural rights and practices within our own waters. It seems as if here again there's a hidden agenda to do away with our land rights and our sea rights. Now, as a, an Aboriginal person, I, I do believe you understand the importance of these concepts, that um, it would be good if you could have some input into this and uh, question the uh, motives of uh, Mr. Inch. And I would um, encourage you to look into that because it, it, it's a it's a very... Um, I don't want to interrupt you. Can you get to a question for Ken? Yeah. Could you look into that? It's, it's a very <coughs> delicate situation for us and Mr. Inch because he is saying that we, there is something that we've done and we know that uh, it's not true. All right, two things. Firstly, on the intervention. The intervention occurred as a result of a report of very good friend of mine was the co-chair of that and I had a discussion with her and said surely you would have realised that when you produced that report that governments would have had to have acted on it because we cannot as a society accept the abuse of children. What was the issue was the way in which you, the process was implemented. It was a reaction that saw a number of agencies follow through with the desires of government in that process, got it wrong. One agency that I will acknowledge who did get it right, and I believe that they were probably best practice in the process, and that was the Department of Health and Ageing, who when they went into the Territory, met with AMSANT, which was the peak organisation of the community controlled health sector, with the Northern Territory Health Unit and Shane Houston, who at the time was the director, was part of that. And they met with community people as well and worked out and worked on solutions. What they also made very clear is they were not going to interfere with the community controlled health services in the delivery of services, but would use medical people brought into the Territory under the intervention program to work alongside of them. So there was a parallel uh, approach and certainly I'm aware from my colleagues in that arena that health was much more accepting of the fact of having equal partners. Some of the others didn't and there are some issues that have been continued and yes it goes back to a point that I made earlier that if we want change then the people we're expecting change to occur to have to be equal partners in developing the solutions. In terms of your second part I know Warren Ench in the short time I've been in the House. I have met many of the Aboriginal groups that have come down because when he has delegations and deputations from the Torres Strait Islands or from his electorate, he calls me and I am introduced to them. 
I will talk to Warren about the issue you raised, but I know that he works very closely uh, with Aboriginal people. But how closely he works with Torres Strait Islanders, I can't give you an answer for, but I will certainly give the undertaking that I will follow up on that comment to Warren. Um, thanks, Ken, for um, sharing your thoughts and your wisdom for, uh, with us this evening in presenting the 2011 Rob, Rob O'Reilly Memorial Lecture, and please accept this token of our appreciation. Thank you.